Well, good evening again on a Wednesday evening, this time the night before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve. And uh, I just wanted to uh, say I hope you have a great day tomorrow and enjoy your time with with close family and uh, enjoy all the great food and, and other blessings that come with that holiday. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. Um, I heard a great poem <clears throat> this morning read on the radio, and if you follow my Facebook feed, uh, you saw it, um, and you can check there if you want to know that it's uh, not my creation, it's uh, a professional poet's, and I just thought it was really good, and I wanted to read it at the beginning tonight before we got into uh, our small study and, and really devotional tonight. With some Thanksgiving thoughts, but uh, it's entitled Morning Glory and Thanksgiving Grace by a guy sort of popularly known as Tarzana Joe. I don't know a lot about him, but he's good. And I just wanted to share the poem um, as sort of a thing. I really like the thrust of it and, and the, uh, the point of the poem. Again, Morning Glory and Thanksgiving Grace, and if you want a copy of this, it's available on my Facebook uh, feed. This is what it says. <clears throat> Here's a little notion that I think we should explore. In years we find ourselves with less. We should be grateful more. Putting it another way, so I don't sound redundant, we take success for granted when successes are abundant. Those splendid guiding virtues like faith and hope and charity are valued above others precisely for their rarity. Eyes that kindle passion with their dazzling shade of green are sung in song and story as they're few and far between. Yankee fans love trophies, and they've picked up quite a few, but they'll never know the kind of joy that only Mets fans do. They experience elation that defies both rhyme and reason, and that kind of thing could happen with the Cleveland Browns this season. Yay! That little yay wasn't in the poem, uh, but it comes from the heart of a long-suffering Browns fan going on. So, when you count your blessings in a year of strain and sorrow, think of what you cherish as you say your prayers tomorrow. Those precious, blessed moments that you share across the room are no less consequential if you're sharing them on Zoom. Give thanks for every breath you take, for every race you've run. Remember that his glories rise with every morning sun. I just thought that was really well done and made a, a true and important point. So the, for our thought uh, tonight, I want us to look into what might be a bit of an obscure text, um, maybe a, a book that we don't turn to a lot or read from a lot, but it's uh, from the Old Testament from First Chronicles and chapter 16. And we'll read some verses there here in a minute or two. But before we do, let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for blessing us with every good thing for taking care of us. We praise you and thank you, and we recognize you're the only one who can do so. Uh, please bless us as we say thank you over the next day or so as a nation. Help us to be truly grateful for all the good that we experience, uh, even in the midst of a challenging year. Maybe it helps us appreciate uh, what we experience most times. And tonight, uh, as a church, as we look at this story, 
Um, we pray that, that we will be reminded how important it is to live lives of thanksgiving. Thank you for each person that, that hears this broadcast. Please bless them. May this encourage them to live for you, to live for your son. And we pray that, that your kingdom will, will grow and that we can be a part of that. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there was a, uh, a Christian, a Christian farmer. He had spent the day in the city, and he went to a restaurant for a meal and, and, and sat down. And next table over, there was a group of uh, young men. The farmer, as he always did, bowed his head to give thanks for his food. And one of the young men thought that he would uh, embarrass the old gentleman. And so he, he said, hey, farmer, does everyone do that out where you live? And the old man looked up and calmly replied, no, son, the pigs don't. Well, don't mess with a farmer, especially a Christian one. I want to read... Uh, a few verses from the heart of First Chronicles 16, sort of to begin, and then, then we'll look at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, but there's a psalm, a song, right in the middle of, of uh, First Chronicles 16, and just the first part of that, beginning of verse 8. O give thanks to the Lord... Call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. And it just goes on like that um, through about verse 36. And um, at the end of that, it says, All the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. It's a pretty amazing section in itself. Uh, that psalm in the middle of that chapter. But the, the particular day uh, that this chapter covers... Um, I don't know if you, you remember or, or recall what happened in Jerusalem on this particular day. Um, but there is a big party going on. And, uh, and the reason for that party, that celebration, is that King David has managed to recapture the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark was the symbol of God's presence among the people at that time. It had been lost for some time uh, to the Philistines, and then it was sort of passed around, and it had been gone uh, from the midst of God's people for, for quite some time. And David fights to recapture it from them, and, and he's eventually successful in that. And so now it has made its way back. It's been brought back to uh, the now new capital of Israel, Jerusalem. Uh, there's no temple yet in Jerusalem. Uh, there's just really a sort of like a worship tent. Uh, you remember when they were traveling through the wilderness, they had a tent uh, uh, called the tabernacle that they worshipped around. Um, but that's sort of what they have now in Jerusalem in this in-between stage. And and there's, a, there's this worship tent where they place the ark. But there's a celebration going on. And they're worshiping, and King David is blessing the people, and they're having a feast uh, as well. And so, at the beginning of this chapter that we read from, uh, notice what it says, uh, verse 1, And they brought, they brought in the ark of God, and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people 
in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Well, um, sounds sort of familiar to the kinds of things that that we might be doing uh, tomorrow on our national Thanksgiving Day. And it's really what happens next in the passage that, that I think holds some insight for us right now uh, in verses 4 through 7. Uh, it, says, it says there, reading on, that, that David appointed, starting our reading in verse 4, he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Then it, it lists those individuals. Asaph was the chief, and second to him were Zechariah, Jael, uh, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Mattathiah, Eliab, Beniah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, who were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. Um, I hope you see there what David did that is so important. Um, sort of take away some of the the things that he appointed individuals for, you know, different instruments and so forth. Um, that may not uh, apply to all of our situations. You know, we in, in, in our worship, we, um, our, our instrument is sort of our heart uh, expressed through our lips. You know, we, we think of scriptures Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians chapter five verse nineteen, and then a passage like Hebrews thirteen fifteen. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Uh, and so our worship is normally um, offered in different ways than perhaps it was. Uh, in this worship tent in ancient times. But what David does is really wonderful. He's brought back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, and now he makes sure that there's always someone there speaking God's name, uh, thanking God, praising the Lord. That's what he's done here in these verses we read. And that's what all those strange names are about that are a little hard to to read and pronounce. These were people, individuals assigned to this task of always being there in the presence of the ark, speaking God's name, thanking God, praising the Lord. Constant worship around uh, the presence of God. Constant speaking of God's name and thanksgiving and praise. So, you know, wherever the ark was, and, and later uh, after it was built, wherever the temple was, was really always supposed to be a noisy place. You know, sometimes uh, we think of worship places a lot of times as being quiet, uh, especially when there's not a lot of people around, when, when the body is not gathered. But uh, the, the temple and before that the tent, it was always supposed to be a noisy place. Uh, there were always supposed to be people speaking and praising. So the praises of God, according to the king here, are always being raised. The name of God is being invoked on a full-time basis. So thanksgiving to the Lord is always being offered here. And uh, we even have an example of this um, in this chapter of the type of thing that's being spoken or 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 a son uh, we read a portion of it there, verses 8 through 11. Uh, it's 
much more lengthy than that. And it begins, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. So uh, what David did in this chapter, in setting up this situation, really pleased God. Because uh, in the ne very next chapter, 1 Chronicles 17, God makes a unique promise to David that he made to no other king uh, in the history of Israel. And it seems to be in response to what David did here in chapter 16. You know, today, we don't have priests to stand at the temple in our place and do our worshiping for us. Instead, as, as baptized believers, we're all priests. You know, you've heard the phrase, the, the uh, priesthood of all believers, and that's a very true, that's a very true thing. Uh, we are all priests. And so this constant worship and thanksgiving and speaking of God's name is to be our lifestyle. It's who we are. God has made uh, to us a unique promise uh, to forgive our sins, to save our souls, uh, to give us an eternity with him in his presence uh, based on the gospel, the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. And so how could we do any less than David's chosen men did. Uh, you know, the blessings we've received are so much greater than, than those that they knew. Um, they knew David, but we know the son of David. We know Jesus, the son of God. They had to offer sin sacrifices repeatedly. I mean, every time they went to the place of worship, uh, at least annually on the Day of Atonement, they had to offer sacrifices for sins over and over and over. Ours, that is our sin, in, and, and our sin, sacrifice for sin has been offered once, and we didn't have to offer it. It was offered once for all time by Jesus. Their worship, uh, in many ways, was very fleshly, very physical, and, um, and frankly, very remote from God. I mean, one of the points of the way their entire worship apparatus was set up was to emphasize separation from God. So, you know, there were places only the priests could go, and, and, and there were places even in the, the temple where only the chief priests could go. Uh, we don't have anything like that. You know, uh, our, our worship is, is deeply spiritual. And it brings us into not just a temple, but into the very throne room of God. And it's not limited to a priestly class. Every one of us who are in Christ can access the presence of God. And so... The point is, uh, how could we do any less than David's chosen men did? That is, uh, offer a life full of constant thanksgiving and praise to God. Because what we have is so much greater. Uh, it's a, an interesting story uh, that we just looked at a part of there in First Chronicles 16. Again, if you want to look at... Uh, look at this a little bit more fully, just turn one chapter over and, and notice the way this pleased God and the great blessing that God gave David the king uniquely to him that he gave to none other. God was so pleased with what David initiated here. Maybe some things to think about uh, on our time of Thanksgiving tomorrow. And, uh, and uh, it's just... It's a holiday I love, uh, not just for the food, although that's a big part of it. Uh, but I, I've just always loved the tenor and the, uh, the spirit of this holiday, and I'm thankful for it. So, 
I, uh, I hope you again have a great day and uh, and hope this reflection this this devotional is a help to you in thinking about important things this evening may God bless you and uh, we hope to be able to see you just in a few days on the Lord's Day as we give thanks to God as we invoke his name and sing praise to him in his presence take care we'll see you soon